Professor Dworkin has, uh, uh, will answer questions, and I'll uh, keep the cue. Uh, Ed Baker. I'm wondering, we all face oh, and uh, wait for the microphone. We all, <coughs> is this on? Yeah. We all face the practical question of what to do or what to think. I'm wondering whether or not the interpretive concepts that you describe, uh, democracy, liberty, equality, others, kindness, honesty, whether they aren't a meta level that's put above the interpretive question what to do and by trying to have under one term combined so many instances, they deflect us from looking at the reasons in each case which should be the basis of the answer. And so the question is whether these meta, whether these interpretive concepts are in fact likely to lead to moral error rather than to moral progress. Uh, for instance, dying for equality rather than to dying or put your life at risk to protect members of your family. Uh, so often the concepts uh, mask the concrete reasons in the individual case for how one should, should act. Well, of course, a, a decent conception of the concept should take a position on that. Uh, patriotism and responsibilities to the family are ways of framing sets of reasons in a threshold or preliminary way. And I believe that that is characteristically the way we think about what to do. We find concepts in the neighborhood, ways of bringing our problem under names that, that whose appropriateness we're questioning, and when they're appropriate but seem to pull in opposite directions, whose dimensions we are trying, we are trying to re-examine. Now, there is, of course, in any theory of this character, there's going to be an over-intellectualizing danger. So I'm not suggesting that when people think about what to do, they have all of these thoughts. I do think that we can uh, make sense of the kinds of things that people puzzle about by seeing them as taking generally groups of assumptions collected around names and doing what I say, trying to clarify them through an improved sense of their dimensions. I don't think this is always so. I have a discussion somewhere in the book about the relation between thick and thin concepts of morality. And the, uh, I don't deny that there are some moments in which we think we'll set aside all that and just ask in a, a more uh, basic way, what should we do? And my thought is that these are not so common but that this still becomes, still can best be seen as an interpretive question, pressing rather artificially the, <coughs> the requirements of integrity that belong to conceptual interpretation, pressing those into a reflective equilibrium demand among the principles out of which we act. Frank Michaelman. If, excuse me. If liberty passes the buck to equality and democracy, and equality passes the buck to liberty and democracy, and democracy passes the buck to liberty and equality, and I take it that is the position. Uh, uh, the position is as I have described it. 
does that mean that at the start of the reflection, we have to have a kind of prima facie notion of at least what of, it, of what at least one or two of those concepts is. Uh, is we've got a kind of a rond going on here, and you have to enter. You have to enter the cycle at some point. Uh, and the question I'm asking is, is there an entry point that doesn't presuppose at least prima facie uh, a conception uh, of one or two of those concepts. No, it, uh, it presupposes uh, some familiarity with them all. It presupposes living in a culture in which people are making claims under all of these. And in such a culture, you will have formed an idea. It may be that you have formed an idea that uh, taxation is theft, violation of liberty. And you will approach, you will bring that idea, I hope, to uh, the question, can I sort that with, other, with, the, with, with an attractive conception of the other values in play? And these will not just be equality and democracy. They'll be, th those, those are just the uh, first into the ring when they get punched around a while. Fairness will come in, and uh, dignity will come, all sorts of things. <clears throat> Jeremy Waldron. Ronnie, um, I wonder if you could say a word or two of comfort for the foxes in the, in the audience. The, the, the fox position, and I guess the hedgehog position, each of them could be understood as a well-worked-out philosophical stance of which we've had a, a terrific exhibition this morning or it could be understood as a kind of practical stance uh, uh, an engagement of a certain sort people as far as i know uh, many people feel themselves wrestling with conflicts of values they feel themselves tormented by uh, some sense that what they think about liberty is going to be opposed to what they sometimes think about equality people are tormented by these conflicts, and as I understand, at least a part of uh, what Isaiah Berlin was suggesting is that we should take this torment quite seriously. Now, I take it you don't want to say that they are just making some sort of mistake. You presumably would want to give some account of what's going on when in good faith and quite reasonably a person feels torn between these different values, so that even if they do eventually all fit in the contraption, of the hedgehog's theory, the hedgehog might be able to explain why entering in one way rather than another into the, the workings of the contraption will lead you perhaps to apply it in a different way, or turning the whole thing around so that the liberty end of the contraption bears first upon the problem you're dealing with, seems to have a different feel from turning it around the other way so that the equality side of the contraption uh, bears immediately on the problem you did. Is, is there going to be some sort of comfortable explanation like this of the phenomenology of foxhood? <laughs> well, uh, Jeremy, thank you for that. It's, uh, I, th I think it isn't only foxes who feel these conflicts. I think a lot depends, and this is a question of interpretation of, of Berlin. Frank Michaelman will talk about this maybe in the last paper of the whole conference, a uh, question of interpretation. I think there is a difference between <coughs> these two thoughts. Whatever I end up doing, I do something wrong. What Berlin might have meant when he spoke about a tragic conflict. I, there's another interpretation which would say, whatever I do, I do something that I wish I didn't have to do. I try and explain this at one point by the di a distinction, which I didn't mention just now, between living well and having a good life. I think you might say in some 
cases, my life is really not as good as it might have been because I had to disappoint people. I wish that hadn't been so. But it doesn't mean that I didn't live well. I didn't, it isn't something that I have to take into account in an ethical judgment of wrongdoing. So that's one distinction which, which I would offer the practical fox. Uh, but there's another one that he will find less comfortable. And that is the crucial distinction between uncertainty and incommensurability. Now you can be agonized because you're uncertain, particularly when it's an important matter, when you're just adding what to do with your life, or at least for the next six months. This, this is very important, and you might be uncertain, and which would be a source of agony. People often write, I believe, and perhaps Berlin did, as if the uncertainty should be replaced by a positive judgment of incommensurability. That positive judgment, of course, should end your tension because it says there's no difference between these two. You, know, you can't compare them. They're incomparable, so toss a coin or do something else. Uh, I, my, I believe that we should, the standard, our standard sense of tension should be traced to an uncertainty. The uncertainty, uh, time is limited, life is limited. We may have at some point just to, as Learned Hand once put it, you pays your money and you takes your choice. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the conflict is tragic nor does it mean that there isn't a right answer. Uh, Tim Scanlon, then Rob Sloan, and then I want to open it up to any students' questions from the audience. R Ronnie, I, I almost always agree with your political conclusions. I can hardly think of a counterexample. I sometimes think I disagree with the theoretical framework you've offered for arriving at them, but I'm not really sure. I think I may just, at that higher level, be saying the same thing in different terms. I'm not sure. But here's a, a, a specific question which might bring out what's distinctive about your way of arriving at things. You mention equal voice as one of the important uh, uh, political requirements. Um, so let's take it in, in, an example. Some people might argue that some system of proportional representation of voting is essential in order to ensure uh, equality of voice. You can, it's not just enough to have one person, one, one vote. You have to have, uh, have to have a proportional system. Others might say, well, whether you need a proportional system or not depends upon various local factors about how, how a different system would work out, what the factions are, and so on. So I might say, how within uh, this system does a hedgehog uh, decide uh, whether uh, equal voice requires uh, proportional representation and, and, and what's distinctive about the way the hedgehog does it? In the, there, there are dimensions to equal, equal voice. We have to be clearer than, than my phrase is about what would count as that. Does everyone have to have the same television time as everybody else, for example. And that can't be answered just by looking at the question equal voice. I think that the uh, overall answer has got, again, to be outcome sensitive. We have to say, what is the result of all of this? And does it, in the end, treat people with equal concern? And that we do by constructing various possibilities, seeing how people end up, and seeing whether someone could complain by saying there's a system that would, sat that would satisfy equal concern better and improve my, my position. Now, uh, in the case of voting, 
that it's easier for me to see how the argument would go. I take the case, for example, of districting, racially sensitive districting uh, in order to increase the number of minority uh, <coughs> legislators in a state or in Congress. Now, in one way, that deprives people of equal vote. It may be that the result of this apportioning gives people in one of the new districts less overall power because there are few, there are more of them in the district uh, than the other district. I don't regard that as an invasion of equal concern because we have a justification in terms of a more comprehensive equal concern that satisfies it. Now, it's hard for me to imagine uh, how the argument about proportional representation would go, but I've heard arguments of a, of a kind, and they would be sensitive to uh, the conflict between having a legislature that can't act, paralyzed legislature, because a number of small parties have a place and together they have a veto. Uh, in, in that circumstance, it would not give equal voice to people because people who are members of, say, a right-wing religious party in Israel would have very disproportionate voice through that way. So uh, I, I suspect, certainly I hope, that we would in the end agree on a reasonableness test, which uh, a, a language I certainly could use, uh, but I would stress the outcome character. Rob Sloan. Um, yeah, I'd like to ask about the two principles of human dignity that pervade the book, yeah. uh, and also in Is Democracy Possible Here? Uh, as I understand the syllogism behind them, it's something like, uh, most of us would concede on reflection that we think it's a matter of objective importance that our lives go well. Uh, and then if we reflect further, we would agree that we have no reason to think that that's true only of us, but rather of everyone. So conviction or intuition plays a very strong role there. Elsewhere in the manuscript, though, conviction, intuition is used in scare quotes and is suggested that we can't just rely on pre-philosophical reflection or conviction. So I guess my question is, under what circumstances are intuitions or convictions reliably epistemically? When we can create, construct, and test a suitably expanded network, not the whole story, in which, these, in which the convictions that seem right have their rightness uh, at least not disconfirmed by an expanding kind of integrity. That is my, that's, that's what responsibility requires. So if we say these convictions must be responsible, uh, that is what it seems to me, and then it's also responsible to concede that in principle, you might have to give way if you, if more of your convictions came under, under inspection. Uh, that's, that's what I would want to say about the role of conviction. It's got greater negative power, to my mind. It isn't You've pointed to a case in which I do suggest that asking ourselves what we think shows that we really couldn't live the way we do unless we accepted these propositions. But uh, conviction has the following negative role, which I meant to suggest by, by appealing to Procrustes, and that is that we may, in the grip of a theory, uh, have a lovely additional idea. Some people think that my idea that law is a branch of morality is a push too far. I'm in the grip of a theory, and so I, and, and, and nobody can believe that. So the, 
as it happens, I can. But, <laughs> but uh, if you can't believe it, you would say, here conviction disqualifies it. I've listened, I've listened sympathetically, but authenticity, a virtue I also talk about, uh, requires that I can't accept this package because I can't believe it. Uh, yes, the person here in the fifth row. Hi, uh, Jonathan Gingrich, Harvard Law School. I'd like to push a little bit on your answer to Frank Michaelman's question. Um, you suggested can that... I, can you raise your hand? I'd like to know where... Right here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you suggested that people have to bring their own lives and their own experience of their lives to understand at least some of the values that form this circle of buck passing. Um, and you suggested that people might bring their conception of whether taxation is thievery to bear by seeing how it fits into that system and seeing whether it's coherent with the other values that are part of it. But if people have highly varied lived experiences, they might have not just disagreements about whether taxation is thievery, but about a very, very broad range of political ideas that might cause them to have different very different conceptions, not just of liberty, but of all of those values in that circle. So if that's the case, how does that affect your moral epistemology? That is, how can we think that our conception of these values is true if it's heavily dependent on uh, our own lived experiences, if not as individuals, as a society, that may differ very substantially from other societies? Well, first, we we distinguish the question of the best explanation, causal explanation, of why we think what we do from the question of whether what we think is true. That is, we don't regard the fact that if we'd been in another culture, we would have formed very different views as in itself impeaching the views we have. I think that's very important and very controversial. I don't, I, a couple of chapters of the book are about the relationship between causes of moral belief and the soundness of moral belief. So I take that to be a very important distinction. Yes, I would have had different views if I'd, if I'd lived in Texas, but, uh, <laughs> I was about to say fortunately, but that's wrong. <laughs> as it happens, as it happens, I grew up in New England. So, uh, but, but the fact that I would have had different views had I lived in Texas doesn't mean, it's not a, not a reason for skepticism. I go back to what we were talking about this morning. The only case for skepticism is an internal case. You know, skepticism is a very live possibility, but it's, it's not going to be generated by facts of history of that kind. Uh, now, <clears throat> so I have to think, and <clears throat> I have to do the best I can, recognizing that yes, how I think is, is affected. I find, I find in recent years a remarkable correlation between uh, young philosophers' philosophical views and the views of their supervisor of their thesis. <laughs> I find, I, I offer this, the population isn't large enough for me to have any firm view about this, but I continue to be struck by it. Uh, we, can't, we can't impeach uh, those views, any, any such reason we just have to do the best we can and recognize, as Cromwell said, we might be wrong. Now, the other side of your question, though, is about what we think of, if I can use the term neutrally, the Texans. That is, what do we, what do we think about the people who really do, they like capital punishment and so forth? Uh, do we have to say, well, there, uh, for them, it's right 
because that's the way they can formulate in a coherent whole their opinions. Now, there's a, <clears throat> there's a threshold question of translation. We have first the question of whether they're using the same concept we are, and the fact that they've got a word justice in our language doesn't automatically settle that. There has to be enough similarity of instances, paradigms, if you will, so that we can say, yes, we're not talking past each other. This is a disagreement about this concept. And then, we, it, once we've passed that threshold, there's no reason why, as part of our careful analysis, we shouldn't come to the conclusion that they're wrong. They are making a mistake about the best justification and what that requires of the practices that we share, assuming we share enough to say we're using the same concept. Let's have one more question in the fifth row, just down the fifth row, the next person. <coughs> Hello, I'm Ray Langton at MIT. I, have a, I wanted to ask you about the hedgehog. Um, so what makes the hedgehog happy is to have one big idea. Um, one can imagine a political philosophy that would make a hedgehog even happier. You know, the one big idea might be, you know, government never jumps in to, um, to, to hamper my um, freedom understood in the most minimal sense. So that would make the hedgehog even happier. So I am taking it that uh, this raises a sort of methodological issue about um, wit, what is driving what. So one, you, is it that um, the true political morality happens to be one that makes the hedgehog quite happy? I mean, pretty happy, but not as happy as the extreme hedgehog happy-making one I mentioned. Um, <laughs> Or is it that you know hedgehog methodology leaves, uh, leads us to the true political morality? Which way round does it go? Do you see what I mean? I do. Yeah. And uh, but I want to defend my friend the hedgehog. I mean, he doesn't. He doesn't get happier the simpler the idea is. <laughs> <laughs> At least my hedgehog doesn't. Uh, <laughs> now the argument. I didn't go into this today, but I do go into the book. The argument takes us into the extremely difficult question, what makes a moral judgment true, if it is true? And again, this is all treacherous terrain, but I argue for a distinction between, roughly put, science and value. And my view is a scientific judgment, a ju judgment uh, how things are, whether there's water on the moon in some star in a distant galaxy, some planet in a distant galaxy, uh, there can be bare truth. That is, it can just be true. Richard Feynman at some point said in explaining uh, quantum electrodynamics, he said, uh, when I finish lecturing, you will understand what is true, but not why it's true, I'm afraid. And the reason you won't understand this is I don't either. <laughs> Nobody understands it. It just happens to be true. Now, uh, that can't be. I mean, somebody can't say, I don't know why capital punishment is OK. I mean, it just happens to be true. Moral truth can't be barely true, in my view. It's true in virtue of a case, and that case expands and expands. And to put it rather crudely, maybe we'll have time to do better over the next uh, day and a half, but that's all I have time for now. The, the bigger and more unified the case, the better, more responsible. That's a hedgehog's basic anthem. Now, someone sent me a cartoon from the New Yorker recently. Well, not so recently. 
which I wish to share with you. There's a cartoonist in the New York, he's been there for years, who draws a scene in a bar. There's the same tired looking bartender with an apron and he's always washing glasses, wiping washed glasses. And there's always somebody on the stool across from him, some customer, who uh, talks to him, and the bartender always looks bored. In this particular case, uh, on the stool, there's a hedgehog. And the hedgehog says to the bartender, I know one big thing. <laughs> Wanna know it? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Ronnie. So, thank you so much, Ryan, for those remarks and the questions.